Welcome to The In Chamber, the place where we focus on the issues and people that shape business success. I'm your co-host, Rebecca Patrick. I'm the Senior Vice President of Communications for the Indiana Chamber of Commerce. Joining me at the microphone is Anthony Shutley, our Director of Communications. In Chamber is presented by Work and Learn Indiana. Today, we're excited to talk with the co-founder of our first ever Coolest Thing Made in Indiana champion, Richard Worsham of Janus Motorcycles in Goshen. Janus Motorcycles bested 64 other manufacturers in the state in the bracket style competition that was determined through public fan voting. Richard will also share what it takes to turn that entrepreneurial spirit into a success story. Richard, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. First off, congratulations on winning the competition. <laughs> What's your reaction to Janus Motorcycles winning that and being voted the coolest thing made in Indiana? Well, first off, it's just really exciting. Uh, it's been exciting to just participate, period. Um, every round that we participated in was exciting, not just for us, but to share with our family, our crew, everything. So it was a really exciting. Um, and to have won it is, is really, it's really something to be proud of. Um, Indiana is known for its manufacturing. So to, uh, to, to be, to be named uh, coolest thing made in Indiana is a huge honor. Um, and I'm just, uh, we're all proud of uh, our team and our community that has helped us along the way to get here, as well as all of our family and supporters and, and our customers who uh, turned out for the vote um, and really helped us out. So excited and proud is a, a really good way to put it. Good. Well, tell us about the product, the motorcycles themselves. Uh, what makes them unique and appealing, even to those who maybe have never owned a motorcycle before? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, they're, what makes them unique is a pretty easy, easy, easy question to answer. They are very uh, unique motorcycles in the current um, world, the, the industry. Uh, the industry has uh, really gravitated over the last few decades uh, or longer toward larger, faster, heavier, louder, <laughs> you name it, er, uh, motorcycles. And what we do is sort of the exact opposite of that. We make motorcycles that are uh, approachable, quiet, lightweight, um, and uh, unintimidating uh, motorcycles. Uh, we also do so with with a, a kind of a, a almost obsessive level of local manufacturing and handcrafted um, attention to detail. So we are fortunate to be in Northern Indiana where we have a, a huge wealth of manufacturing knowledge. Uh, if you other Indiana folks aren't aware, uh, this is the RV recreational vehicle capital of the, of the world basically. <laughs> um, and that means that there are job shops, uh, powder coating, laser cutting, you name machining, whatever, all there's just hundreds of them. And they're all with, you know, down the week, we, we say down the road, right down the road. And so we partner with a bunch of those different uh, shops and that allows us to have a very um, personal uh, attention to each bike, uh, not, not only in the way each bike is made, but each every customer gets to um, pick a huge number of options from color to accessories to finish. So they're very tailored for the customer while being still a production motorcycle. So um, that's sort of the, the, the uh, one of the things or some of the things that make us really unique. Talk a little bit more since you, since you mentioned, how do you get that local connection with local suppliers, vendors? How, how easy or hard is it really in this day, this day and age to do that? And what made you make that a priority? Well, I'm, I'm a, I'll start by saying I'm not from Indiana. <laughs> I'm from Virginia and I came out here to go to Notre Dame and I made some friends. I brought a, a little vintage uh, moped out with me uh, and met friends through riding and wrenching on that. In, while in school and we we would customize them and we would we started making performance parts for small displacement bikes and it was really a word of mouth um oh we'll talk to this guy that's powder coating we'll ask him who would you recommend for your machining or whatever and so we also happened to the, some of the first people we worked with were amish and 
that automatically makes it a more word of myth <laughs> process because they don't use the internet uh, like, like we do. So a lot of it has been, oh, my brother does this or my uh, teacher does this uh, or I've heard of this company down the road. And so that's been a lot of the way we've done it. And, it, and I wish I could, well, I don't know how I wish I'd say it. We are very lucky to have just been here. We didn't choose it, uh, but it, it, it turned out to be a really good spot or doing what we're doing. Sounds like a lot of it just happened sort of organically. Absolutely. You talked a little bit about your background and that you went to Notre Dame, but talk a little bit more about maybe what your expertise is in. Did you see yourself going down this entrepreneurial path? And you said you um, were doing things with restoring, you know, old mopeds. Was that what inspired you to, to go into having this sort of retro inspired motorcycle? How did that happen? Well, it, it, again, it was kind of an organic thing. I, I, my tra- if you looked at my uh, resume, it wouldn't really, <laughs> motorcycle manufacturing wouldn't be the top of the things you'd expect. Uh, I have a, my, well, I guess I'll say my family has mostly been, um, both my parents are, my father's an architect um, interested in history, both my, both my parents um, more on the art side, I would say, and design. And uh I started when I was a kid drawing a lot of vehicles and becoming really fascinated with the design and the art artistry of it. Uh, then I felt, then kind of fell into the, the, the vintage stuff through a love of the design, <laughs> not because I wanted to be a motorcyclist. Um, and then my, I actually went to Notre Dame for, I got a master's in, well, my undergrad is in literature, master's in architecture with a focus on classical architecture, which is what Notre Dame is sort of the world leader in. Um, kind of where I went there. And so really, I would say that my, what, what has led me to it has been the design and the, the, the uh, beauty of vintage, uh, older designs, classic designs, sort of like the classical architecture that I studied and the literature I studied. Um, and, uh, so that was really the entry point for me. Um, and, I, I picked up the, the specialty skills along the way. <laughs> so the aesthetic of how the motorcycle looks and maybe feels for the, for the buyer, that's sort of your vision. Absolutely. Vintage. Yep. I, I always tell people I never intended, I, I, I've never, when I was a kid, was never interested in motorcycles. I was interested in the design of cars and it was through riding them because I enjoyed the way they looked that I fell in love with them. It's one thing, as you know, everyone knows, to have an idea, but to be able to take it to that next level and have it take off and come to fruition. I, for Janus Motorcycles, I believe that was 2011, correct, when, yeah. when, when you started. H- how did you get that going? What was that process, process like? And when did you feel like, okay, this, this is going somewhere? Well, it took a while. Um, it, was, it was very... Uh, I mean, or maybe organic is the word of the day here, but it was a uh, kind of a harebrained idea. Um, and we just uh, said we were going to do it <laughs> to start with. And we got a lot of, and maybe the, another thing, a really critical part is we had a lot of encouragement from our community. Uh, the, the building that we are still in was uh, at that time, what was called the Innovation Center. And it was a local guy who, wanted to try and get different kinds of cool things that are being, were being made in Goshen, a place for people to do that. And that, uh, that was a great kind of, it it helped us. And he, and he helped to get uh, the zoning changed for us. And the city worked with us. They said, okay, well, light manufacturing downtown, that's not really what we usually do, but sure, this is a neat idea. So we had a lot of support getting going. Um, From there on it, you know, it, it was a lot of dedication, <laughs> but, uh, uh, it was, um, it was, it's always, it's been fun all along. So a lot of support, a lot of support. Good. Richard. So our listeners know, um, what we're talking about in terms of your motorcycles. Um, I mean, I, I think people are going to get this picture that you've got these custom motorcycles, you know, they're hand built, hand painted. Sounds expensive. I mean, it sounds really expensive. I, I was surprised when you and I talked a little earlier about the price point of these motorcycles. So, so people know what we're talking about. Tell us about the price point of your two models. Yeah. 
So let me just say one thing about that. You know, like, I think you really highlighted a good point, which is that a lot of people, the, the word custom just comes out of their mouth when they hear and they think chopper or bobber or some kind of flashy thing that's been made out of other people's parts, other motorcycles. And, and that really isn't what we're about. We're a production motorcycle company that just offers a lot of different options. Um, so our, we have a couple of models. Um, we've been making our, we started off with a 50 CC. So you can really see our small displacement moped heritage, a 50 CC. And then we, we launched um, five or six years ago, a 250. And so again, if you're not familiar with motorcycles, that's the size of the engine. And that in today's standards is a very small bike. <laughs> um, uh, and then this last spring, we launched our 450, which is like a middleweight, um, still by, a, by a Harley Davidson standards, a small, they, they don't make anything that small. Uh, the 250, uh, we've always, we, what we, our goal is to, pro, to, to provide something, to manufacture something that is affordable. Um, and so what we've, what we've always kind of set out to do that. So our 450, or sorry, our 250 starts at Right, uh, at the 22 model year is $8,400 for so 8,400 starting price. There's a lot of options you can add to that. I think probably most people when they leave the shop are oh, maybe a little over 9,000 um, in a bike. Uh, and uh, what we're trying to do with that is, is really tell the story of it, the price of a bike doesn't have to be related to how big the engine is. It has to. It, it also relates to how well it's made, uh, the whole story, the experience of riding. And so we've been pretty successful at kind of telling that story of, you know, kind of changing it a little bit away from the idea that, okay, the, the bigger the bike, the more money it, it, more money it brings. Um, but again, yeah, that's a, that's a very affordable price, really on the low end for a new motorcycle today. Um, and then our 450 uh, starts at th uh, 13,500. And there are also upgrades for that one. There are, are not as many upgrades for the 450 because it's a newer bike. We, you know, we just kind of gradually launch those after the, after we've got it in production. So those are the, price I, don't wanna, yeah. I don't want to get off into the weeds too much with the engine size, but just so people know the 250, I think you said really isn't highway. You couldn't take that on the highway. Oh, you can, look. you can, it's just a, your, your top speed is probably 65 or 70 miles an hour. And a lot of people, when they get on the highway, they want to be able to pass other cars. I drove a 250 all the way from San Francisco to New York on 80. <laughs> So you can do it, <laughs> but the 450, it really allows you to, that one's top speed is 90 miles an hour. So, you know, we're, we're trying to allow people to hop on the highway if they need to and go 85, if they, if they um, feel the need. <laughs> so you, you talked a little bit, Richard, about your mentors, kind of flesh that out a little bit for us. How, how important were those mentors, um, you know, for the guidance uh, when you started the company and all the way up even now? Yeah. Um, we, we had, when we first got started, one of the folks that really uh, gave us a lot of encouragement along the way, more encouragement really than anything else, um, but also some entrepreneurial experience was a guy named Tim Braun, who was at the time the entrepreneur in residence with the, um, now I'm going to forget the name of the um, uh, fund here in Indiana, um, Elevate Ventures. And he was, he was local uh, and he just kind of, he just showed us all, you know, how to make Gantt charts and, you know, <laughs> simple things like that and helped us get some initial funding. We got a, a loan, a small loan to just kind of get off the ground, get our insurance, stuff like that. And then over the years we have been, I mean, if I was going to say anything about this, the whole, the whole podcast would be how thankful we are and how blessed we feel to be in an area where we have uh, kind, experienced, wise people in our community that, that want to see people like us succeed and that devote uh, their time and resources to helping us. Uh, we have, we are very lucky to have several business partners that have been with us for uh, some of them many years now um, who have helped both uh, financially invested in us, and even more importantly than that, given us the breadth of their many years of experience. So as you can imagine here, you know, being this entrepreneurial area, you know, in manufacturing, some of these folks have, have had 
you know, many companies that they've successfully built and um, are still wor working with or sold. And so they can bring that experience and, sh and help us out. And that's really even more valuable. You know, of course you need funding, uh, but that kind of th thing is, there's no price you can put on it. So we, um, that's really valuable. And then uh, also we've um, been lucky to have another guy. I mean, same story, uh, incredibly generous with his time, but he uh, is very experienced uh, with lean manufacturing from his uh, experience, his business. He turned his business around really with those principles. And he's been coaching us over the last few years. And the, the, the effects of that and the results have just been mind boggling for us. And we're, um, yeah, the, the, that if I was going to say, if anything you want to look for starting a business, it's that kind of mentorship, um, really valuable. Well, Janice Motorcycles is the uh, dictionary definition of lean. I mean, 16 full-time employees, full, four part-time employees. Yep. That's lean, Richard. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, um, what were the major obstacles uh, getting to market and, and how did you overcome those? Oh, goodness. Um, let me think about that one. Um, really, it's, you know, what we're doing, it's sort of like the, what 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 causes it and what is the result are, are simultaneous um, that the barriers to entry for a motor vehicle are astounding <laughs> like it's just way harder than we ex expected it to be that said when you really give it your best and you uh get have some luck <laughs> which we are definitely have too a lot of uh, we've had really good fortune it it, it uh because it's so difficult it, it, it you, you get attention, um, you get, you, you, you can make a mark. Um, so I, I guess I would say some of the barriers would be like the certifications that you have to go through EPA, California ARB. If you want to sell in California, you have to get through that. And those are very costly um, and very complicated. And we did it with a carburetor, which is, you know, most manufacturers are going away from that because uh, it's much easier to get a fuel injected bike through modern emission standards. Um, and let me, th I'm trying to think of other, uh, really, I think probably the, the it's, it's the, the amount of um, capital that it takes to start a motor vehicle company. And, and, and a lot of other companies too, it takes a lot, but it's really capital intensive. And so for us, what really helped us do it is patience and bootstrapping. And I, I say that like, as though it's in the past, but it's absolutely how we continue to operate is I, we were just talking with a, a welding representative coming in and we're, we're trying to, you know, what kind of, you know, we can, what can we give you that you'll give us a welder? <laughs> so there's a lot of that kind of like, how do we work with the bare minimum uh, in a small lean shop like we have? Um, here I am sitting down in our um, uh, parts warehouse right now <laughs> uh, to be able to do that. And that takes, sometimes it takes patience. You have to really believe in it and say, I'm going to make some sacrifices now so that we can grow gradually. And the word I really love to use is incremental. Um, you, you know, you don't, if you're going to try and do something like this without massive amounts of capital, you've got to do it incrementally and be patient and let it, let it grow. I hope that answers sure. your question. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. If I might ask, I mean, how much money did it take to get the company off the ground and, and how much money did you sink into it? I, mean, I know a lot of entrepreneurs sink, sink some serious coin into their own company. Yeah. Well, I didn't start with much, <laughs> so I didn't put, I, I put in my sweat, uh, but we did, we got a, that loan initially was for $25,000. <laughs> so we thought, oh my goodness, that's a huge amount of money. Well, it didn't last very long at all, um, but we, we bootstrapped and in, in, in that, the, the real sense of the word where we would, we didn't pay ourselves anything to start with. Um, we had very, or I had a very, um, I have a very, very uh, patient and supportive wife who, uh, paid the bills while we kind of got it off the ground. Um, and, and then we would basically, when we built a bike, the early days, it was one bike every few months. We were very slow, small, just two of us starting it. That's what I mean by the incremental kind of approach. And the money that came in from the bike before paid for the parts for the next one. <laughs> so that went on and I ended up, uh, again, kind of bootstrapping and I, I got another job. And at a certain point, we kind of saw this, things were sort of gelling and we were getting some press and it was good. And so I thought, well, you know what? If I don't quit my 
day job here and put my time in, this is all going to be, it's not going to work. And so I did, I quit, moved back to Indiana. I was out of state for, uh, I was just doing sales and design remotely. And then I said, okay, we, we got to make this work. So we moved back and my business partner was who was building all the bikes at the time. We, we hired our first employee and, uh, uh, just kind of, um, g- gradually gained some more, some guys that were interested in marketing. Well, you were talking with them yesterday. Um, uh, we were, uh, with Grant and Jordan who do our video and our marketing and gradually that turned this idea into more of what we would today, a formal company. Um, so again, there's, there's kind of baby steps, um, up to, up to where we are now. So, and then along the way we've, we've, we have received, uh, funding, um, from, from what we, what I guess would be a silent partners, um, who, who are, silent in, a, in, in the best way in the sense that they they let us run the company but when we have questions we say tell us all you know <laughs> and they'll give us advice um which is, is so valuable so so what, what year did you start taking a paycheck from the company i started in probably 2014 um taking a so paycheck. three years no paycheck with the company yep that's a long time yeah so, and um and it wasn't because i had a lot of uh, you know private resources. It was, we, we, we made it work by, you know, sad, sad gigs and stuff like that along the way. So what was, what's at the root of the appeal of the product, Richard? And, and, and by the way, where did the name Janus come from? Yeah. Well, I'll answer that one first. Uh, Janus uh, goes back to my love of literature and history. Um, Janus is the Roman um, deity who is he presides over doors. Um, so he's like, well, actually the word janitor comes from Janus is the, the he cleans the doorsteps. Um, but Janus was the Roman God who looks, he has two faces. One looks to the past and one looks to the future. So he's in the doorway, literally. It is also, it's kind of duality, war and peace, past and future. January is the beginning and the end of the year after the same uh, deity. And so we really felt like it spoke to what we're trying to do with our motorcycles, which is make a modern motorcycle with modern electronics, brakes, et cetera, that uh, celebrates, it doesn't have to just be stuck in the future. It can also look to the past, take advantage of that. So what was your second part of your question? <laughs> well, what's, at the, what's at the very root of the appeal of, of your product? Well, I think that the, the root of it probably has something to do with my interest in motorcycles and the way I got into it, which was kind of sliding into it. Um, the, 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 love of design and of uh the aesthetics and of simplicity uh the people can work on the bike themselves and the, the, again how i got into this through wrenching and riding with friends and these are motorcycles especially our 250 that are almost designed to be maintained by the owner so we are one of the few manufacturers in the world that well, first of all, we have a four-year warranty, which is long, longer than anybody else's. And we support, our warranty supports owners doing their own maintenance. So we have a huge YouTube library um, that covers everything from how to clean your carburetor to how to adjust your valves. And we love it when c- customers do that because that's part of the, that's almost part of the experience you're, you're getting. And customers love that. That's what our customers really like is that ability to connect with the machine. It's not just a, a car or, or something that you just get in and you use to get from point A to point B. It's an experience. I think that's the best way to describe it. Now a quick word about our sponsor. Work and Learn Indiana is where work-based learning connections are made. It's free, it's easy, it's a win for both Indiana learners and employers. Its newly updated website hosts Indiana's largest statewide marketplace of work and learn opportunities that promotes talent and career development. Richard, let's take, dive a little deeper into some of these things. One thing I wanted to ask you is, how did you end up in Goshen, the facility? And I think we have, think you have two places there, maybe one across yeah. the street from another. Uh, tell us what those facilities are. Yeah, so our, our main facility, which we... I've been in from the from the get-go is an old dry cleaner. Um, we're located in downtown Goshen, right, uh, literally in the the heart of the downtown. So we're behind the th- old theater, 
and our local coffee shop and our record store. Um, it's an old dry cleaner that we started off in the back bay and then we gradually would annex a little more when we could afford the rent and a little more and a little more until we um, a couple of years ago bought the building. Um, this last year we opened our uh, fabrication shop, which is another, um, basically we're, we're bringing more of our manufacturing from our partner vendors around the county to actually doing it ourselves. So when we launched the new 450 model, we decided, hey, this is a great opportunity for us to make the chassis in-house. Um, we make the chassis for that and all of the fenders for our 450 and 250 line. Uh, that's about a half mile south of town, beautiful old factory building. It's still, I say south of town, it's in the town again, we're really about that staying really uh, as an urban kind of amenity <laughs> as well. Um, and then we have another little, uh, we call it the Janex, uh, the, the Janus Annex across the street from the coffee shop where we do a lot of our um, uh, office of uh, sales team and, and marketing and stuff there. So very, very, uh, we love Goshen. <laughs> and was Goshen picked because back to your college days at Notre Dame, not too far away or how, how'd you yeah. end up in Goshen? Uh, uh, we would ride old bikes down here. There was a really neat bar called the, uh, constant spring, which was a marvelous is still a marvelous bar. Um, and we would come down and we were just fascinated with the people. Uh, it was a friendly group of people. Um, just a, it's a, it was, it's even more thriving now of a town than it was then, but it really had something different. And it sparked our interest. Neither, neither my business partner, who's, who was from Elkhart, which is half an hour up the road and me from Virginia were familiar with it. We learned about it, made friends with the people here. And then uh, when we opened the, the shop here, just the support we got from folks was I think probably the main reason um, that we, was the, is the community. I was curious as to where your customers come from. They're all over the country, Indiana, does Indiana still lead the pack? in purchases mm -hmm. or tell us a little bit about your customers and where they come from. Yeah. Uh, I think because we are, uh, unique in the way that we sell our bikes, we're not, we don't have dealers. So in a weird way, we're more similar to Tesla than we are to Harley Davidson. <laughs> um, we don't have dealers, so we do everything online. Um, so that allows us to have a, a more national reach, um, which, doesn't mean that Indiana still doesn't lead the pack. Uh, we are we still have more owners in Indiana, and we sell more to folks here than anywhere else. Um, but it's not uh, California, Florida, Texas, New York aren't far behind. Uh, Michigan is a big uh, riding state, so we do have a global, uh, or sorry, not global, national uh, presence. Um, but uh, it, I would say it follows more the national trends and where where people buy motorcycles. <laughs> And you guys are selling about 400 bikes a year, correct? Yeah. Last year we did 350. Uh, this year our goal is going to be over 400. So excited about it. I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Richard, how closely have you worked with local and state government? Uh, have you have you gotten um, incentives or relief or in any way? Uh, we have, well, locally, I would say we've gotten a lot of support just from like, you know, your zoning board and stuff like that to be able to do what we do in an urban environment. Um, uh, in terms of really probably the thing we've noticed the most in terms of federal support has been after in the wake of and during the uh, COVID pandemic, um, we've uh, received some of the, you know, uh, PPP funds, which have done, have just been very, very useful for a small company like us with so few employees. It helped us to, to pay people um, and keep people uh, employed during the, the, the six weeks that we were actually completely shut down. Um, and then we, uh, the SBA uh, off is offering some great uh, loan packages right now for businesses such as us. Um, so that's been really helpful, um, really, really helpful. Uh, this, the last two years have been difficult to say the least. Um, and it's great to have that kind of support. Richard, I just want to tread backward a quick second here. We, we had talked about the price point of the motorcycles and you and I had talked a little bit about the revenue of the company and the growth. I think you guys are growing at 30 to 40% a year uh, right now. Uh, ha have you reached the point of profitability yet? And, and you know, for um, an aspiring entrepreneur, how do you set the price point of the bike, of your product mm -hmm. to achieve profitability? That's a really good question. Uh, I, 
obviously, as, as you can tell from the way that the earlier part of the, the conversation went, the first, at first we were not profitable. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's incrementally become more profitable, uh, probably really even through these most difficult years um, is when we've started to gain traction there, um, especially with the help of some of our mentors. Uh, the lean approach has really helped us. Um, and I can proudly say the last four months have been the four best months we've ever ever had in terms of profitability. Uh, and, and it's it's uh, it's setting your price point. I mean, when we first did it, we go, oh, we, we can't go more than than this. How, how you know how can we do that? And we didn't base it on profit, you know, on profitability. <laughs> and in in recent years, that that is that is how we do it, and and that makes so much more sense. Um, but you do have to. I mean, believe it or not, you have to set the price so that you uh, you come out ahead at the end. At least you can pay your your uh, your bills. So, uh, I hope that answered your question. So, when did you guys cross over into profitability, Richard? Uh, we have uh, gotten into profitability in the really the last what year and a half of really con more consistent profitability. Uh, it's you know you have a great three six months and then you know you're you're container of uh, uh, breaks from wherever gets held up and, you know, you have half completed things, but yeah, it, it's been, it's been re fairly recently uh, to be, to be honest. Um, and that kind of speaks to the, to the, how capital intensive this kind of thing is. I think probably uh, something similar or something simpler would be a little easier to do, but um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been, it's, it's, it's difficult. And I think you have to go into these things with that understanding that you, it, patience is probably the, the greatest uh, skill you can have when it comes to trying to do something, uh, uh, start a company that's this uh, um, maybe um, what was the word? audacious. <laughs> I mean, it seems like um, your company is like the perfect David and Goliath story. You've got Harley Davis and Honda, all these global dealers. Uh, do you feel like Janus is competing against the bigger motorcycle companies with these uh, huge marketing budgets, or right. have you carved out your own different niche? Yeah, that would have been a mistake to have even seen them as competitors. Um, you know, certainly we, there are plenty of people that decide that they want uh, a bigger, more storied, older, more, you know, a brand with more uh, history behind it. But we, from the beginning, have, have, have not attempted to take on uh, these industry giants that have, you know, at the very least, uh, multiple decades of experience in, in Harley's case, over a hundred years of, of, of beautiful and successful motorcycles. But what we really have is carved out a, a niche for ourselves of, of, uh, something that's different. You know, the, the, the uh, our general manager puts it really well where he says, it's like, there's a big playground of motorcycles out there and we can have our little corner and Harley Davidson can have their big corner. And, that's fine. <laughs> There's more options for folks that, that ride. The, the motorcycle seems to have a certain, uh, a certain charm to them. I, I'm wondering how big you want the company to grow. What's the sweet spot? And uh, what has the growth tra trajectory, you know, what, what, what is it going to be long term, do you think? Well, uh, we, we want to, I, I guess, what makes us unique and what makes us successful now. I don't think that's going to change, um, or I don't want it to change. <laughs> that, that is our, that is kind of our secret sauce, and that is being individual for the owner and and um, having employees like we have uh, that are that really care about what they do, and they take a great deal of pride in it, and they enjoy building these bikes. So we have a lot of room to grow uh, and make many more bikes every year, but. There will be there will come a time when, you know, I think probably I think I've heard that the main challenge to Midwest manufacturing is something you know is probably autom automation, you know, or at least to communities and, and their success, and that's something that it just doesn't fit with us. So when we get to that point, I think that's going to be a really good indicator that that uh, that we need to uh, think about the scale of what our operation is. And right now, you know, we're, we're really, we're within stone's throw of 500 a year, um, which I couldn't have believed if you told me that 10 years ago. Um, and I could easily see a thousand, but 
somewhere in that range is probably a, a good place, at least right now, to, to, th to think about. Um, and it'll help us re to maintain this, this sense of community we have that really defines what we are. Sort of to piggyback onto that, where do you see the company in five years from now? Well, I don't know if I would have seen where we are now five years ago, but uh, my my ability to prophesy isn't great. But <laughs> but uh, I would say I'd love to see us be a community centered company with with the same level of employee retention that we have right now. Like we 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 don't really have any turnover. Um, we we uh, we. People, when they come to Goshen, that's what they want to talk about. So they're proud. They're proud. A lot of people are proud of it. Uh, we have a lot of really cool things in Goshen, but, but uh, you know, what we do is certainly, I think we, we add something here and, and we, we certainly reap the reward of being in Goshen. So I think that being a part of the, of the, of the town would really be what I'd love to see. I don't know scale wise or anything like that, but I don't want to see us out in an industrial park. <laughs> a question for you to sort of tie together some of the sprinkles of wisdom you've had from your journey throughout this conversation. If you could sort of tie together, what advice do you have for budding entrepreneurs out there that are chasing their own dreams? That's a really good question. Uh, I think it, first and foremost, it probably takes a little bit of uh, audacity. It's going to kind of do it. I mean, that's what Put one foot in front of the front of the other, um, but but really, it's having those mentors in that community. Uh, that, that's really what I mean. I keep talking about that, but um, surrounding yourself with the kind of people that you not only trust but that you uh, that you learn from. I mean, every single one of our folks that are building these bikes, I'm just perpetually amazed at the skill sets that they have. And most of the people that we have, that we employ are not experts coming in. They, what we look for is somebody who's passionate and is excited about what we're doing. And we can train you to do, you know, most of the ta tasks we have. Um, but right there, even, even with that said, it's amazing the kind of skill sets you have and the, um, the people you run into uh, doing something like this. So really surround yourself with, with people that, um, that you can trust and will, and it will tell who, who will tell you if you're doing something stupid, but will also back you up if, if it's something cool. <laughs> Need both of those. Definitely. <laughs> uh, Richard, thank you for the conversation. Thank you so much for having me. In chamber is presented by work and learn Indiana. Hoosier businesses can save 10% off their estimated annual workers' compensation premiums, courtesy of a new Indiana Chamber partnership with the Clear Path Mutual Insurance Company. Find eligibility, eligibility details and more at indianachamber.com clearpath. As always, thank you for listening.